thank you everybody for, for being here after lunch. Um, so one of, this is one of the projects that we have been doing and, and this has been done mainly with uh, Dan Kalachi and, and Shewen Don and, and Sandy Pellam. Um, so one, uh, the project is, is basically that we have been doing and this is actually the, the people that have been collaborating and we have been collaborating also with two companies which have helped help us to build what I'm gonna show you at the end which is this Atlas of Inequality. So um, as probably you have seen throughout the day, uh, our group is basically um, kind of, um, uh, so we are kind of famous for using all digital cranberries that you can obtain from mobile phones, from credit card data, from Twitter, uh, from other databases and transform them into uh, metrics of behavior, how people actually move around the cities, how people uh, interact within the companies, how people um, create new solutions, how people actually learn. Um, so one of the things that we have been doing in the last years is actually used uh, also those da that data and those behaviors to analyze problems which are of, um, of what we call social good. And this project that I'm going to talk about is actually one that is uh, taking into, into account this, um, well, uh, paramount of, uh, problem that we have uh, in our societies, in our city, which is the problem of inequality. Inequality is actually one of the biggest problems that we have in our cities today, especially in the United States. Inequality um, in the cities today is, at, by some metrics, is at uh, the same levels as it was at the Great Depression in the last century. So this is a big problem. It's actually um, becoming more and more important because more and more people are living in cities. So probably you have heard about Morgan talking about um, that inequality is also affecting job places, our job places and our jobs and our, our labor markets. I'm going to show you how inequality also affects the way we see the city and the way we see um, economical segregation. When we talk about economical segregation, this is basically the picture you will see in, in, in most of the talks. This is just about uh, the difference just by, by, I mean, in 20 meters, you can have two different neighborhoods or two different areas in the same city. This is, by the way, this is Mexico, DF. And this is actually an amazing um, uh, article that appeared recently in National Geographic is uh, inequality by drones. So basically these are pictures taken by drones in the different uh, areas in the, in, in the world. And you can see clearly see that this is more like a, it, it looks like a slum, while this looks like a rich area. And basically just separating these two areas is, is this street, which is 20 meters. So basically this is what you see when you talk about segregation. Let me show you, for example, a little bit more closer to us. This is the Boston area. Um, you can see here, this is the Charles River, okay? And this is the city center, we are here. So you are here actually. Um, and each of these areas that you can see, those, those, each of these polygons is what is called a census uh, census block group, which is one of the administrative units that the census uses to put us, every one of us, into a place. Um, and the colors of uh, on the census areas actually indicate the median income of the households there. So you can clearly see um, very poor areas, and oops, sorry, very poor areas in the south of Boston, uh, Dorchester, etc. And then you have very rich areas, which are this is Newton. For you, for those of you that know uh, this area, this is Newton, Brookline, etc. And this is. And this is what it is. <clears throat> but one of the things here, by the way, I mean, some people probably ask me, yeah, the census only counts on two, 250K uh, per year, but it's 250K and more. And that more probably makes a lot of difference, but this is how the census goes. Um, but one of the things that when we started working in this project, one of the things that actually is, uh, is encoded into this picture is that you are and you behave as your neighbors. You are and you behave as wherever you are sleeping at 3 a.m. in the morning. So that means that every, every, all the behavior, everything that you do in your life for the census is encoded into these polygons, okay? And actually, I can tell you that I, just, I was just uh, across the river in a conference in the Boston Area Research Initiative, and there's a lot of people making policy using these polygons, a lot of people using policy. I mean, like deciding where to put money, where to distribute, for example, uh, resources, where to actually open a new line of, of public transportation using this polygon, this is static picture where you are at 3 a.m. in the morning. But let me show you that what, uh, what we have done in the, in the last year is by is using data that comes from our mobile phones 
to analyze where actually are gonna, are, uh, what are the behaviors of people and how we are gonna be moving around the city and actually how we are encountering ourselves, other people, okay? So this data that you're gonna see here comes from mobile phone, um, uh, for your mobile phones. It's actually based on what we call location-based services. Every time you use an application that needs your, your location uh, to provide you a service, we have that data. And each of the points that you see here is a person that is staying for more than five minutes in that position. And you are gonna see four colors in, uh, in, the, in the visualization, and those four colors correspond to the different quantiles of income in the, um, in the Boston area. So basically, we divided people into four buckets, uh, the one which is low income, the middle low income, the middle high income, and the high income, okay? Just to put in perspective, the low income is not homeless. The low income in the Boston area is uh, between uh, 20K per year, low, uh, household income, to up roughly 60K. So this is low income in Boston, okay? That varies very, uh, very much from, from, from other areas. So that's low income. Uh, so this is actually the time of the day. This is a particular day that we have in our database. It's the time of the day, so this is midnight. And what you see here is basically that at night, you see a lot of people, a lot of red people, or, uh, let's say mid income, mid high mid income living here, a lot of red here, etc. But then when the morning starts, you can clearly see that there are many places in which people get together. And actually, they come from many different incomes. You can clearly see, for example, the airport here. And we can actually see even the, how they get together by gate and by terminal. We also see here, well, you don't see here, but this is the, the, the hospital area in which there's a lot of people getting together, the shopping areas, the city center. And then at night, people usually come back home and they, they, they stop. But you can, let me show it again. You can clearly see people living here in the, the area segregated, but then when the morning starts, people, I mean, uh, different backgrounds and different incomes are actually getting together. So the idea is that we have to move away from uh, this way of understanding our cities in these polygons, these static polygons, and starting thinking about the city, about places, about where we actually get together, and we actually interact with people from different incomes. And if there is segregation, segregation is gonna be also happening at the level of places, not only at the level of where we live. So this is what we want to do. We want to understand what are the barriers that we have in our cities that prevent us from meeting people with other different incomes. Okay, <clears throat> so we built, uh, actually, um, I'm gonna tell you the, the, the end of the story because we analyzed this, uh, these places and we built uh, what we call uh, the Atlas of Inequality, which you can find in inequality.media.mit.edu. Right now you only have the Boston uh, area. And the idea of the Atlas of Inequality is to shift the discussion in our cities by, uh, from census areas and from where you actually sleep to the places you actually work, the places you visit, the place you hang out or the place for leisure, for example, how you, I mean, museums or where you go during the weekends, et cetera, okay? So, and the idea, once again, is that uh, most of the segregation that we experience in our daily lives is not where we are actually sleeping, it's where we decide throughout the day, okay? So this is the Atlas, this is a video, so you can clearly see how we interact with the, with the Atlas. Um, it explains a little bit, I'm gonna go through that, it explains a little bit what is the Atlas, but you can actually zoom in, and we have about 40,000 places in the Boston area. Each of these points is actually a place. It's a shop, it's a bridge, it's a bus stop, it's a, um, it's a restaurant, it's a university, it's the building of the university. Actually, you have two points here. Well, I, don't, I don't know if you're gonna see this, but here we are. No, this is actually the, uh, the, the Kendall area, and this is the Clover Food, and this is, Chipotle, you're gonna see in a minute. Yeah, I always tell the same story, so probably you have seen that. But you can actually uh, navigate this and you can find uh, different places. You can also select by different type of, of, a, of um, category. You can also select which are the places which are more equal, et cetera. So you can actually go and see what are the places you go, the usually go, or the places you live nearby which are more segregated. The idea with the Atlas is that we want to, um, um, I mean, obviously to have the data out there helps people make decisions, but also we want to create awareness of, uh, of uh, two, a couple of things that I'm gonna tell you about in a minute, which is, um, which is related to the segregation of places in our cities, okay? So how we measure segregation in places? This is actually how we do it. Um, what we have is uh, trajectories of people. So we have people actually walking down the street. And what we measure is when a person stops for more than five minutes in a place, okay? And um, what, we, what we have is also where this person lives. So we can estimate 
uh, roughly the income bucket in which, uh, in which they are. Basically, if they are low income, middle low income, middle high income, and high income. And then by measuring what is the mixture, what is the, the, the different uh, economic profiles that you have in a place, we come up with this one, this histogram. This histogram is basically the amount of time that each of the income groups spend in a place. So for example, for this Y, which is a restaurant, most of the time, uh, most, of the, most of the time you will see people from this uh, income uh, bracket, which is the highest one, okay? And then we are gonna measure in, uh, inequality of a place by looking at very simple thing. Because we have uh, divided the people that live in the city in four buckets, actually of equal size. A very equal place is a place in which this distribution, sorry, this distribution of um, time that each of the groups spends in a play, is go it has to be flat. This is what we call equal place, okay? And we are gonna say that a place is unequal if they, most of the time that we see people there, they come from only one income bucket, okay? Once again, this is one definition of inequality. You might have your own one, and there are like, I mean, if you go to literature, there are about like 25 definitions of inequality, but this is the one we are, we are using for, for describing the places, okay? And uh, one of the main criticism of this one, I'm advising uh, your questions, is that this inequality measure doesn't actually tell us about whether it's towards poor people or towards rich people, okay? So it's, you can be unequal uh, um, symmetrically to, people, uh, sorry, um, to poor people and to rich people, okay? So very, very simple definition of inequality. So what we did was actually to measure uh, inequality for each of the, all the places, and in the map, you can see each of the points here is colored according to that inequality. So blue means that the place is, uh, is uh, very, uh, very equal. So basically, you can see, for example, Chipotle, Mexico. This is the Chipotle, which is in Kendall Square here, okay? So if you go to the Marriott, this is Chipotle, which is there. And then you can clearly see that the distribution of uh, the different groups visiting Chipotle is actually very, very flat. And the inequality is very low there. And you can, I don't know, if you go these days, you can actually, I, probably this is changing because there's a lot of, if you go to Chipotle today, you, call, you will find a lot of people working in the, in the buildings here. You can see that, I mean, you can really feel that this, it's, it's actually a very equal place. You have people from many different backgrounds. But if you just walk, and this distance here is 100 yards. If you walk, walk less than one minute, you can go to Clover Food Lab, Okay, and most of the people that you will see there comes from the fourth quantile for the very rich area. Um, let me just remind you that this is a, a vegan food uh, restaurant, it's upscale, the food is kind of, uh, uh, it's not really expensive, but it's a different, uh, let's say, audience. And also on top of Clover you have Google and Facebook, so that could also tell you something about that. So one of the things that we found, actually, was, which we were expecting, is that segregation happens even across the street meaning that two places which are just 100 meters away, 100 yards away, can be very different in terms, of, in terms of segregation. So it's not only the area you go to, it's even the place you go to. And actually just crossing the street, you can find a place which is very different in terms of inequality, okay? You can clearly see that you have a lot of bluish and a lot of reddish points over there. Uh, well, this is just a technical definition of that. This is what is called the spatial correlogram of, of this. And you can clearly see that this is basically the probability that you find a place which is very similar to the place that you are starting from at, at this distance here, okay? And you can see that um, it drops really, really quickly. And basically in three, 30 meters, the probability that you find a place which is similar to the one you are is 50%. So it drops in 25 meters, okay? So this is one of the things that we found. And the other thing that we found is this. So that's, that's a cloud of points, but let me explain what is the cloud of points. It's very easy to understand. Basically, this is you staying at home, okay? And this axis is basically the distance you have to travel to go to a place of this category. For example, a big box store, typically, people travel around 10 miles to go to a big box store, okay, in the US. This is for the whole US. Uh, people travel much more to go to a gate. They go, I don't know, 20, 25 or 28 kilometers. But you don't travel a lot to go to a school, okay? Or to a grocery store or supermarket. And then in this axis, what you have is the average segregation of the place you go to, okay? So you can clearly see, for example, that the most segregated place in the US, uh, one of the most segregated places in the US are check cashing, cashing places and pawn shops. These are the most segregated places. But then immediately after that, it comes schools and church, okay? These are the most segregated place. Work was traditionally seen in this country as one of the opportunities to actually get 
together and encounter people of different backgrounds. And that's true. Work actually, the, all these pink, uh, pinkish, uh, let's say, uh, uh, dots here are related to workplaces, and you can clearly see that offices, buildings, and these are ones are actually co-working spaces, et cetera. They are actually uh, as mixed as the average variation in, in our database. But not all the workplaces. If you work in a factory, you are much more segregated, or a warehouse, you are much more segregated than if you work in an office. And on the other, uh, other side, you have, this is the, 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 the green ones are medical areas, are medical uh, places, but the less segregated places in the United States are, on average, once again, this is on average, are airports, exhibits, and something that we were discussing this morning on the other side of the river was museums. And actually, not all the museums, science museums, are, is, are one of the most less segregated, sorry, places in the United States. So this is the other result, is that by making the choice of going to an art exhibition or a science museum, you might be less or more segregated in your life. Okay? So this is actually the, the outcome of, the, of this, this, uh, this plot. It's even so that just choosing different food you can get different exposure to different people. For example, this is the same plot as before. This is the distance you have to travel to go to a Tex-Mex restaurant in average in the United States or to a Spanish or Caribbean restaurant. By the way, Spanish here is, uh, I'm from Spain. Um, Spanish here doesn't mean Spanish restaurant. I mean, it includes Spanish restaurant, but it's mostly a confounding, let's say, it's, it's Latin American <coughs> also. <clears throat> and then you can see here the average segregation and the distance travel to get, to get there. Of course, the, the ones which are really, really far away are farms, et cetera, or New American, but then the, the closest ones are Spanish and Caribbean. Once again, you have this relationship between segregation and how far you have to uh, uh, travel there. But you can see that, for example, just deciding fast food. Let's, let's go for fast food, for example. Let's go um, and see, well, I want to a fried chicken, okay, or I want a burrito. This is a huge difference between the places. Okay, just by making the decision of having fast fry, uh, sorry, a fried chicken or fast food. By the way, for those of you who are interested in, in, in cook styles, what, one of the things that we found which is amazing is that all the Asian food, except in Chinese, except in Chinese, are in this area. Okay? And Chinese is here. Okay? So if you, for example, made the decision of go to a noodle place instead of a Chinese place, and well, let me remind you that Chinese place is uh, in the United States could also have noodles, but the noodle place is more like a, I don't know, like an upscale Chinese. You can have different exposure to different people, okay? So category matters. I mean, the choices you make to have pizza today or to go to another type of restaurant can influence the people that you see in your life, okay? So this is, a, I don't know if this is gonna be recorded because I can get in trouble by naming some people, but anyway, I'm gonna make a joke. So these are two different, three different uh, brands, different brand, uh, companies. We serve you coffee. Uh, the difference of uh, black coffee, I mean, the pure black coffee between the, these three places is just 10 cents, okay? Of course, you can have uh, espresso, um, whatever, in, in Nero, which you can have in probably in, in Dunkin' Donuts, but just deciding which one of those to go can impact the segregation. Actually, the segregation of these places is different. This is the average segregation that you can find in the different places in the Boston area. So Dunkin' Donuts is actually the place which is most segregated, while Nero is actually the, the less segregated place. Once again, let me remind you, the segregation here is equality. Is what is the probability that you find there are people which are come from different income, income quantiles, okay? Okay. But for us, and I think uh, in the human dynamics, we are much more interested, of, of course, our, the context is very important. The places we have in our cities are very important. But for us, the most important thing is that is individuals. How are individuals segregated? How are individuals um, experiencing segregation in their lives? So, because we have also individual data, we can say, for example, that this person goes to a Seituna cafe, which is actually real, uh, real close here, Clover, and he works at MIT. This could be me or, or, or you, I mean, some of you. Um, and by measuring how much time this person spends here, 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 we can also compute this. We can compute how much time you see people from different quantiles in your, in your life, okay? And this is actually the six months uh, behavior. And we can tell you how segregated you are, okay? Individual, actually, uh, the second phase of the project is gonna be a simulator that tells you how segregated you are respect to the city, to your neighbors, and to the people that go to the same place that you go, okay? And what we found is that there are, we can explain the segregation of people by different variables. For example, 
choosing between a Chinese and a Russian restaurant, restaurant that, that is a choice, and that could impact the segregation you see. But there are other types of variables, for example, where you live. For example, what is the typical income in your neighborhood, or typical, for example, uh, or the region that you live in the, in the, um, in the area, or the population. Or we have uh, like a 50 different variables that come from census, going from the mode of transportation that they typically people in that area take, to income, to uh, percentage of employment, um, um, educational levels, etc. And on the other hand, these are actually the play, these are actually where most people talking about segregation are now. They are talking about how is the, the area, I don't know, um, does the area has public transporta transportation? Does the area has a low, uh, is a poverty level uh, in the area very large, et cetera, things like that. But on the other branch of this uh, tree, you have behavior. I mean, the things that you do in your life. Like, for example, let me, let me explain you this one, which is called, we call it exploration. Exploration is basically um, the amount of times that you uh, go to a new place. There are some people in our database that just go to three places, period. So, which is the workplace, the, 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 the favorite restaurant, and then, I don't know, home. These are the only things. But there we have other people in our database that are constantly searching for new places, new restaurants, new, I don't know, um, um, museums, new, I don't know, uh, exhibits, etc. And we call this uh, feature of behavior, we call it exploration. Of course, we, all, we have choices. So if you like only fast food, you might have different segregation that you like, for example, other type of food. Or if you like museums, maybe you have different um, um, segregation that if you travel, for example, internationally. And the other thing is the uh, mobility patterns, which is basically how much area do you cover? And what is the typical distance that you cover? I mean, there's some people that have to stay at home just because, I don't know, their, their work or, or the um, or the family commitments required to stay at home. So you know how much of individual segregation in, data, in our database comes from this branch? Only 35%. This is actually a model that we run. So 35% of the segregation that we experience every day in our lives comes from where we live. Actually, we can tell you that 75% of the people that you see every day live more than 50 mi 15 miles away from you. 75% okay? of the people you see every day comes really from far areas that, uh, that your neighborhood. And 65% of the, of the segregation that people experience are choices, are choices. When we got this thing, and actually we were talking to, to Sandy about this, this is good news. This is really good news. Because the, whole, the US have been spending billions, literally hundreds of billions of money in changing people's neighborhood. They have been changing, they have these affordable housing programs. They have all these uh, vouchers for, for affordable housing. These are actually programs that cost a lot of money and are based on the fact that you have to move people from one neighborhood to another. Okay? But in, on the other branch, this one, we can change this. And maybe you, you guys, I mean, coming from companies can help us change this. Okay? Because we have to change the behavior. We have to actually... Um, um, encourage people to try new things, to be more explorative, to have different choices, or to, I don't know, move around easily, okay? So that's actually very good news, the fact that the segregation in the cities is just coming from this behavioral part, okay? So I'm finishing up right now. Um, so uh, the platform, this uh, inequality.media.mit.edu is out there, you can go. Uh, what's next for the platform is that um, Dan Kalachi, which is the, the person that is uh, taking care of the platform, is not today, but um, he has been doing an amazing job. So next week we are going to have New York, okay? which, is, uh, which is a to the force because we go from 40,000 points to almost 200,000, uh, uh, let's say, uh, places in New York. But in the following weeks, we are going to roll out all the other cities that we have in our database. And the idea is to hopefully to have more cities in our database. But this is not enough, because we are just having a um, static picture of what is happening in our society. We need a dynamic picture of what is happening. For example, uh, um, the good thing about having the map up there is that there's a lot of people that are contacting us, and they are asking us about, hey, if I open a coffee shop in my neighborhood, is this going to create more segregation or less segregation? And for that, we need to create dynamic maps. So what we're going to have is the same static maps, but with a, um, a scroll that you can actually go in time. And you can see how the, the places in your, in your area have, have changed. But still, we are not actually happy with that because we have to do causality tests. 
okay? So, and for doing causality tests, we have to go either to natural experiments or, or actually to matching, let's say, techniques that tell us exactly that the, the, the fact that this coffee shop is actually segregated is because of the coffee shop and not because of any other place, other things that are happening, are happening there. Finally, we would like to go beyond uh, these polygons that I showed you at the beginning, which were the census areas, and we would like to start building what we call the behavioral census. So I, probably for, your, for, for policy makers, it makes totally sense to, um, to think about how many poor people live in an area. But we can complement that with people, how many people live in that, that, in that area that have, uh, I don't know, like museums, or that usually every day make the decision to go to new places, etc. And that behavioral census, as I was showing you before, could up actually uh, up to 60% of the segregation that we are seeing in our cities. So maybe we want to intervene and we want to impact, then we have to start building this behavioral census in our cities. And that's it. Thank you very much. Hey.